Monday's techniques, uh, I wanted to take the moment to uh, explain something. Um, there's a lot of values to sort of coming to meditation so regularly. Um, and as a teacher, it's like the game I try to play for myself, the struggle in, you know, orchestrating an endurant practice is sort of keeping it fresh. But uh, if we become too preoccupied, and I'm speaking to myself as well with like attaining new experience or attaining new understandings or acquiring new little bits of information, we might bypass or we might overlook um, you know, a hugely important quality of endurance practice, and that is practice in and of itself. That the value of this space and this like new community is that now we understand and we're getting into the routine of coming up Monday, Wednesday, Friday, waking up and, and meditating. And that is more than anything what will sort of inspire our pursuit and develop our experiences more so than the knowledge and anything I have to really say. So I just want to like make that clear that your practice is the most valuable aspect of your practice. Cool. So with that, I have a little story to sort of empower our understanding of practice and the value of practice. And so Indra, Indra is an ancient Hindu god. He is sort of like the god of heaven, something like Zeus for the Greeks. Uh, and Indra, for whatever reason, is very upset with the village of farmers. And he curses this village to withhold the seasons for 12 years. And in this, Indra goes to Shiva. Shiva is the lord of destruction, but also the lord of yoga. And he asks Shiva not to play his little drum, because his little drum represents spanda, or the rhythms of reality in the universe. And because the seasons are deeply rhythmical, if Shiva were to play his drums, he might conjure the seasons back into motion. And so Indra asks Shiva, Shiva abides to the god of heaven. Okay, Indra, I will not play my drum for 12 years. And so the villagers now are sort of dealing with this, this catastrophe. And the villagers, knowing that the seasons aren't going to come, stop tending the fields. And because there's no point, right? No rains will come, no crops will grow. What is the point of taking care of these fields that are now barren? But one farmer in the village decides to keep tending the fields despite the fact that no crops will come and the rains will not come either. And the villagers are confused. Why? Why are you taking care of these fields? Uh, and the single farmer answers, because when the rains do come, when the seasons do return in 12 years, if I have not farmed for 12 years, I will be so far out of practice that I won't be able to take care of my farm once the seasons do return. And so Parvati, Shiva's consort, hears this farmer's reasoning and goes up to Shiva and tells him the story. And she's so inspired by the single farmer willing to practice despite Indra's curse. And Shiva thinks and he goes, wait, if I don't practice my drum for 12 years, I'm going to forget how to play my drum. And so he picks up his drum and he starts practicing his drum and the seasons immediately return. And the farmer that was taking care of his fields uh, sort of reaps the bounty immediately of that return of, of, of the seasons and the return of sort of uh, the rhythms of life. And so the point is, uh, even if there might not be a need to meditate, usually people really flock to meditation when there's this chapter of suffering or chapter of distress or all of this. Um, even if that is not present and there seems to be no need to meditate and your practice hits a plateau, uh, it is still worthwhile to manage your state of mind and keep your focus strong and keep your sensitivity strong because the storm clouds do come and they do come rather spontaneously and sort of out of nowhere. And when we are out of our practice and we sort of fostered a disconnect with ourselves, uh, we might find ourselves less capable when the chaos arises. And so this, you know, COVID-19 situation is a perfect example, uh, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, uh, we all have many more personal pandemics waiting for us in the future chapters of our life. And through this practice, I hope you can all feel it at this point. You know, most of you have been doing this for two months around that. Uh, the effects of your meditation should be becoming apparent to you now. Uh, that it does ground you. It does provide a sense of peace that does not seem to be as fragile as as maybe it used to be. And that's because we're developing a relationship to this inner experience. 
So that's that. It's like practice is valuable because it is in preparation for the storm clouds to come. And I was thinking personally, why do I like to practice? Uh, The greatest storm is arguably death, right? The complete release of the self. And many meditators, many yogis especially, they practice to prime themselves for death. They want to die not just well, uh, but skillfully because they believe there is an opportunity as the sheaths, right, the koshas, which is what we talk about on Wednesdays, as they start to pull away from us, as the body dies, as the energy starts to dwindle in our nerves, as the mind shuts down, as our deeper emotions and intuition start to break down along with the mind, uh, that inner consciousness is sort of the last thing to go out. And as a meditator, if you're familiar with that, because you've been practicing your entire life, you can feel that chain of experience, that shedding of these petals of your former being. Um, And in that, there's just a mystery experience that yogis are really committed to experiencing firsthand. Um, So at the very least, that's that final moment that might prove uh, motivational to continue practicing throughout your decades. Awesome. Cool. So what we're going to get into today, techniques, they're pretty much just four. Be still, sit well, breathe very slowly, and push back your thought process. But within these four techniques, there's nuances and, and one sort of key, uh, key detail. Just because you can sit still for 30 minutes does not mean you've learned how to be still. It means you're sort of tolerating it. When you love to be still, that's when you've mastered the first fundamental. And so... And that goes for all these four techniques. Uh, So we're going to get into stillness today. And the way we're going to really test our stillness is by working kachati mudra. So we're going to hold our tongues up into the palate of our mouths, which is sort of a nuisance, but it'll provoke that agitation and test, am I just tolerating stillness or do I really love the process? And we're actually going to work with our mudras a bit more intensely. And all that means is that Instead of letting the hands curl as you let them rest on your knees, which usually happens, uh, I want you to stay you know, preoccupied with keeping the fingers straight and the mudra sort of intact. And this is just going to challenge that capacity to be still. Uh, and if stillness is in and of itself pretty easy for you, uh, the next step is learning to relax your muscles while being still. And this is all going to add to the euphoria and hopefully your appreciation and increased love for the art of stillness. Cool, sweet. So let's get to it, everyone. Again, so happy you're all here. Comfortable seated pose. Eyes closed. And so right away, build your posture. Hips tilt forward, spine lifts, wrists resting on knees. And now feel the intention of stillness start to sprout in your mind as a thought, as a possibility. But not necessarily a reality yet. And start to notice through your willpower and focus, you can take this possible effort of stillness and make it true. And simply said, that's the commitment. I will no longer move. To create a little challenge in our practice today, tongue to the top of your mouth, Kichari Mudra. And so the Hatha yogis would cut the bottom of their tongue so that their tongue becomes more mobile and they would lift the tongue all the way into the back of the throat. And they believed from that they could clog a little opening from which Amrita, right, the nectar of the soul would drop from the skull down into the belly. And as they clogged this opening and kept Amrita in their heads, 
they slow down the process of aging and tiptoe towards immortality. Keep the tongue on the mouth. And now design your mudras. Bring a random finger to each thumb, but then straighten the remaining fingers. And notice that within the hands alone, there's this tapestry of tension and stillness. That it takes a little more work to keep the fingers straight. But that work doesn't have to be bothersome. The contractions on the top of the hand don't have to aggravate. Nice steady breaths. So if you find that over the course of your meditation this morning, your tongue has dropped or your fingers have curled, mindfully place the tongue back onto the palate, mindfully straighten the fingers again. Tolerating stillness is not the mastery of this first step. Loving the experience of stillness is the mastery of this first step. Be proud that you're practicing. It's commendable. I'll chime back in in 10 minutes. Let's all take a deep inhale. Slow exhale.
tolerating stillness, forcing your body into stillness, is not success entirely. But loving the effort of stillness, that is success. And that love is the consequence of both your nerves and your mind. If you slow down your breath, your mind will lean into its appreciation and lean into affinity. This isn't so bad. It's actually quite nice. One reason to love the act of stillness is because it's supernatural. In all of nature, no organism restrains its instincts. The plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, they move through their impulses without doubt without restraint. And so through stillness, we redirect those impulses to experience the heaven of self-control. And so breathe into that for a moment. and feel the joy and the pride of controlling yourself, even in this seemingly innocuous way. Because that self-control proves to you in this moment that you are conscious. And in that consciousness that you have power, And these are things we forget. So recommit to the experience of stillness. Feel your stillness. The next step within stillness is to relax your muscles. So take advantage of your exhales. Every time you exhale, feel the wash of softness Ripple through your body from the crown of your skull to the tips of your toes. And as your muscles relax, the pull of gravity should become more pronounced and a sense of sinking further into stillness should become apparent. softer.
as you willfully relax your muscles, the intrinsic euphoria of your body should come to the surface. The comfort of your mass The pleasure of moving blood, tingling nerves. The pleasantness of the air on your skin. Now from this centeredness, and this stillness, most of all, start to listen outside. So from self-centeredness to world-centeredness. And there's evidence that something has changed through your stillness. Something internally has adjusted, which is literally your nervous system and in that your thought process. Because you've been focusing, your sense of self has become more transparent. So you sense this moment for what it is, without your biases, without your cravings. Start to notice that this room, your space, is more inspiring, more meaningful, more enchanting. Its mundane beauty is more obvious. Start to deepen your breath as if as you inhale, you can pull in this moment's beauty. And in these final moments of practice, just repeat the phrase, I have returned. And in that, contextualize your practice as a journey back into centeredness, a journey back into openness and emptiness. Bring your hands to heart center very mindfully. Shoulder blades draw down the spine, perk up your chest slightly. And take the moment to remember, identify, and define this attitude, this mode of your body as distinct that you had to control yourself and interact with your nuances to shift yourself into this mode. That's all meditation is, a unique mode that is specifically human because humans have the willpower and the self-consciousness to restrain their impulses. Lift your thumb knuckles to third eye center. Tilt the hips forward again, lift through the chest, boost your power. And let's go back to technique. Focus so much on the pressure between your thumbs and the skin of your forehead that parts of the body blur out, that your environment fades away. 
And you should experience little blips of forgetfulness if you're present to it. In the same way that there are little blips of silence when I speak. Focus more. Deepen your stillness somehow. Restrain your trembling or your wobbling. And as you hold your body to greater stillness, self-control, that's something to love. Let's take one more inhale. Slow exhale. Release your wrists to your knees. Ending this ritual of self-control as you open your eyes, I am no longer meditating, and that space dissolves. Awesome, good work everyone. So just ending with that same little story, unlike that farmer, we are not in under the curse of Indra, right? So when we practice, it still bears fruit. We still experience a little peace, a, a boost in presence, a capacity to recognize life's aesthetic beauty or meaning or possibility. So we're not in the, in the sort of dire situation that that farmer is yet. Um, it proves difficult to practice day in and day out. Uh, so when we start to love the effort itself, love the stillness, love what it means, love what it represents to us, and that, that is all bolstered by uh, sort of educating ourselves and what's happening when we practice, what are the consequences of our practice, I find that it really boosts our willingness to participate uh, um, over time. Uh, so you can conjure that love by just trying to love it. Um, it doesn't have to be as mysterious as maybe you might think. If you just actively try to love your practice while practicing, love will spontaneously emerge. And that in itself is mysterious and really beautiful too.